Imagine a science fiction film We're in a cold, distant, urban landscape Imagine that we live in that future right now The mega city is a reality and it looks a lot like the visions of science fiction films through the 20th century. Giga cities are soon to be. In the midst of this cold, bleak vision of the future, we have the human being. It doesn't fit the cliché of modernity. It is personal, warm, intimate, social. In our search for opportunities, money and a better life, we move to the cities. But does the way we build cities invite for human interaction, inclusion and intimacy? What is the scale for measuring happiness in a city? Sometimes I would say that even today, we know much more about a good habitat for mountain gorillas or Siberian tigers than we know about a good urban habitat for Homo sapiens. Understanding the nature and the attitude and aspiration of the people is the missing link. And definitely, there lies the solution. So when is the question coming? What is the uh, definition of modernity? What is the definition of being modern? If you think about how we lived historically, we lived in tribes and clans and extended householders from big villages, uh, big family groups. And I guess our natural state is to be together with other people. And it's a very, very modern phenomenon that we suddenly live either in very tiny households, like two, three people, or live completely on our own. The time around 1960 was quite an interesting period where the boom the economic boom and the in, in, industrial age in the Western countries really took off and a lot of people moved from the countryside to the cities and there were big housing shortage. The modernists really expressed that this was a big cut with everything of the past. And the housing was conceived as a machine for living, and the city was conceived as a machine for living. Actually, the city was out. If anybody at any time wanted to pay professionals to make a city planning idea which would kill city life. It could not have been done better than what the modernists accomplished. When I was a, a kid, 
So uh, China is totally different. At that time, uh, the economic situation is not that great. People are poor. So a lot of people are worried about their food. This country was more about agriculture, but uh, since the last 30 years, the opening to the door to the world and the, the Chinese people are moving to the cities. So the urbanization is the real challenge and also the speed is very fast. The good thing is for economic perspective, but the, the, the other, on the other hand, this poses great challenges for environment, energy, and people's livability. All the people moving into the city has to be customized to the city life and change their living styles. Also means the city is becoming bigger and bigger. Today we see the process of urbanization most strongly in China, where people are undergoing the same modernization as the West but in less than a generation. New housing developments are built on the fringes of the cities and people commute to work in the center. The high-rise business districts drive the economy and have become the signature image of a modern Chinese city. We were so excited to compete with the old foreign countries. Whether you have a taller building, we have an even taller building. So, however, after all these years, thinking back, and I think we made a lot of the same mistakes as the Western countries has made. This change also lost a lot of the old city characteristics, such as the hotel life, such as the neighborhood, uh, the uh, small neighborhood, the neighborhood tightness, even down the major streets. The, uh, the, the shops are along the streets, you don't travel very long. Traditional Chinese houses, the hutong, were arranged around courtyards and alleyways. How does it affect us as people when a physical landscape changes? When a social corridor, a neighborhood corner, or an occasional meeting place disappears? When our generation becomes richer, and we, we tend to appreciate the opportunity to own a car, have a car, and to drive a car, yes.
the consumption of cars and real estate is the main generator of growth worldwide. It's a national Chinese policy to build roads and highways to maintain the high growth. In the coming decade, the number of vehicles is expected to double fivefold. We learn a lot from America. We learn that lifted highways, we lift the superblock. So I think it's really important to think beyond uh, just those modern stuff, but really look at how those things support people and if this is the right thing to support Chinese people. Despite the disappearance of traditional lifestyles, big modern cities are successful growth engines, which have moved 300 million Chinese out of poverty and into a living standard equal to Western countries in only 20 years. Most of these people live in cities. It is estimated that another 300 million will reach this level of wealth in just a couple decades. When the city becomes bigger, your biking becomes a too long a trip. It doesn't fit anymore. You have much more, much greater pressure for your commuting because you're commuting such a long distance and take much more time out of your day. When they get home, it's already dark. After dinner, you feel so tired and nobody knows each other very well and uh, I don't know my neighbor at all. You could do more uh, human-oriented planning you think from a people's end. As you are a person, what kind of life would you like to have? In the 1960s, Copenhagen went through the same modernization as China today. Going to and from the residences was very boring through maybe green lawns or there was no activity, no shops, no nothing. Just you and the grass and the sky. And that was the main critique of housing in the, in the 60s and the big estates was that it was made so that you have isolation perfectly. You go out and water your plants in the garden and look up and down the street and there's nobody coming, you go in again. Nobody knew that the way we built cities had any influence on lifestyles and people's life. There could be some theories about it, but there was no knowledge. And then I realized that a lot of basic knowledge was needed. Since the 1940s, city planning had been structured around the motor car. The traffic flow was documented systematically to improve the speed and efficiency of cars. Jan Giel decided to develop a different set of data 
that could challenge the single-minded focus on traffic flow. As a teacher at the School of Architecture, he included his students and colleagues in the research. It was super refreshing just to be at one space a whole day, early morning until the evening, and actually see what people are doing there. How long time are they there? Where are they standing? Where are they walking? And you map it. But at the same time, you see how things evolve. People's behavior patterns in public spaces became obvious when cars were pushed out of the main street of Copenhagen. As more and more streets were pedestrianized over the years, Jan Geel studied how these changes influenced people's behavior. When more streets were pedestrianized, he documented systematically how public life multiplied. The main shopping street became a walking street. Parking was pushed away from a major inner city harbor. Later, the main square became a square. So we found this predictability which we have known about the motor cars, that if you make more roads, you will have more traffic. But now we also knew it about city life, public life. If you have more space for people, you will have more public life. If we can have spaces where most of us feel invited, so you're not in their space, or they are coming in your space, but you are in our space. Then we have this possibility of meeting across different layers of society, different user groups, different lifestyles. And being urban has something to do with being able to cope with the meeting of perfectly strangers, somebody you don't know. It's very obvious that in these cities where they have lost the public space, they are by now generally very interested in refinding and rekindling the idea of public space. What do we do when people are not coming out of their private homes anymore? The, in these cities, life has been totally privatized. In 2007, the methods of studying people and public life were taken to New York. Like many other North American cities, New York had focused entirely on traffic efficiency and built a gigantic system of highways that connected with suburban homes hours away. Robert Moses, in the 1950s, brought an extraordinary amount of change uh, to New York City. And he built a lot of expressways, uh, roadways, so moving quickly is certainly a st still a very strong part of the legacy that we have uh, from Robert Moses. And, and thinking big uh, is also a big part of that. And if you're planning, you know, if you're, if you're a Moses-type planner, you want to control all that as much as possible. And by controlling it, you really sort of, ex you know, extinguish that possibility for life to pop up because you streamline things, you separate functions, you put, um, you separate work from, from play, from leisure, and you think about it in a very concrete system that's an equilibrium, but that's not what, what makes places fantastic. That's not what made the city great then or what is making it great now. A hundred years ago or 60 years ago, the car was new. It, it held the promise for the future. It seemed to be the way of progress. Now we've grown up. We've seen what a fully built out automobile world is like. 
and we see a lot of the negative side effects that people maybe could have appreciated were going to happen 80 years ago, but we're living in a world that's choked with traffic everywhere, where we've made our own human living environment deadly for people. I mean, we've destroyed the human living environment with all of this traffic, and people see that, and they also realize you can't build your way out of traffic. I mean, the, uh, we've tried to plow highways through neighborhoods, to double deck highways, to do everything that we could think of, and we've, we've failed. No, this isn't good enough. We've been resting on our laurels for so long. So there was this desire to move beyond that paradigm of Moses. And there's no question if you're a New Yorker, you know that the city needs to change. Our city has been outdated uh, and our systems have been outdated. And so this took a big picture view and saying, okay, we're gonna actually leverage this growth to our advantage by investing in our key infrastructure systems and, and looking at that as a way to uh, bring the city uh, into a state of repair and uh, a state of competitiveness that was, you know, may, would make us the greatest, greenest city in the world. You know, if you see pictures of Times Square before, uh, the image of New York was always sort of fast-moving taxis through Times Square or uh, people, you know, hailing a cab. There was a very dominant, I think, kind of car culture of, uh, of New York City. You know, the traffic planners had become maybe the most powerful, powerful people in the city. The DOT had never measured pedestrian traffic. You know, they had never, um, they'd only been counting cars. They had no quantitative tools for measuring, you know, the pedestrian experience. And so really, you know, there's an adage that is so true in the business world, which is that you, you care about what you measure. They were simply maximizing the wrong thing. So to refocus all of those engineers and planners, you needed new quantitative tools and you needed to give them new benchmarks and new goalposts. And that's what Yen helped us do. Get the baseline data, set some targets, now let's plan our street to meet them. Well, really, our first task was to, to survey streets and spaces and, and monitor how people are walking, how they're spending time in the streets, uh, what type of activities they're engaging in, where they're spending time, their use patterns, um, all sorts of data that basically didn't exist before. The city had a lot of data about private vehicles, but didn't have a lot of data about people. Ninety percent of the roadway in Times Square was allocated to cars and only ten percent to people. And yet ninety percent of the people who use the space were pedestrians and only ten percent cars. So we needed to change the math. What? Times Square has no square. Uh, Eighty-nine percent of it isn't even a square. That's, that's uh, very simple to understand and, you know, people can react to it and demand more. No place to sit along Broadway. Everyone understands uh, that, that's, that that's a real shame. So we were able to, I think, with some very simple, very even maybe banal observations, frame them in a, in a political context that allowed everyone to say, you, you know what, this street is underperforming. This is not worthy of a world-class city. The plan was to define a new way to move in the city. Broadway would be closed for traffic along the major squares from uptown to downtown. And a network of bike lanes would be built to connect with surrounding boroughs. We're very opinionated in New York City, uh, so there were 8.4 million opinions about uh, what should be done. You cannot implement European culture in America. We don't need any bicycle lanes in New York City because people don't like to ride bicycle. Because people don't have time to ride bicycle. 
Monday to Friday, American life is like machine. Any, any type of the suggestion of change was met with resistance because it affected their everyday routine. And I think what this change was spurred on by was more of an alignment, a mechanism essentially. And I think that mechanism was the pilot project process. Overnight, essentially, uh, the street was closed, chairs put in, tons of people used it. There was this huge latent demand that existed the entire time that just shh, souped into this, uh, into this area. But it wasn't quite good enough. You know, people were saying, complaining, you know, this is cheap folding chairs from Costco. That's not New York City. That's not Times Square. Um, so not long after that, they needed to re revise their approach and get some better quality furniture. The idea was doing something and giving people a chance to experience it, not doing the perfect thing and making it right from day one. It's a shift from the one heroic vision to a more iterative evolution of what cities can become. giving people just a little bit of a taste of like what their lives could be like every day of the year if simply the space were designed and managed for them and for their kids and for you know the neighborhood and I am so encouraged by the fact that New York has 50 million visitors a year now and all of those visitors to our city are now seeing Times Square um, you know bicycles everywhere and they're taking that back to Kansas City you know they're taking that back you know to Minneapolis and, and elsewhere and they're saying you know what my idea of a city has just been transformed my idea of a city street is now different than it was before and that's precisely what America needs right now because we have had this love affair with the automobile you know for 100 years and you know the oil's running out and uh, you know people want a different lifestyle You know, at Times Square, there was a snowball fight that, that took place completely spontaneous, completely unplanned. And it's not like I ever thought, hey, we're going to reclaim space here and there's going to be a snowball fight. You know, that um, maybe wildness, you know, of a city um, can really only happen when you have a critical mass of people living their lives in the public realm. You know, when everyone's shuttered indoors, there's never, there's no vitality, there's no spontaneity, and it's, it's a living thing. It's a wellspring of uh, human interaction that is always, I think, uh, feeding us. And you know it when you see it. You know it when you walk down the street, you know, in Copenhagen. You can see that um, organic uh, human uh, quality that I think um, 
good cities have. Chongqing is like many, but maybe especially, one of the cities that is known by its skyline. Driving to Chongqing the first time, crossing one of the bridges to the downtown area, overlooking the rivers, uh, seeing all the high rises, seeing all the neon lights, is in many ways what we expect and dream of seeing in a Chinese city. The downtown area of Chongqing is defined by a peninsula much like Manhattan. Here, the roads follow the length of the peninsula rather than cross it. A new plan for a more effective pedestrian network to crisscross the downtown area was developed. This is a pilot project that aims to influence policymakers all over China. One small route is implemented to show this approach firsthand. We made a number of strategies and recommendations, and one of the places we made uh, a recommendation about was what is called Route 3, which is uh, one pedestrian route in the inner city area. We should consider uh, maybe adding more benches because people still want to sit like this. Because we take some existing spaces and uh, we utilize them better. We make them inviting for walking, for social interaction. Every little corner Every little square meter between the buildings has been given new payment, has been integrated in this new route, and has been given importance for the local community. So over there they took the sidewalk through. I actually thought they had done it here as well at one point. We're creating a pedestrian route. At one point, this pedestrian route meets um, a road etheria or a street etheria, uh, meaning it's an important traffic uh, route in the city. So the question is, who do we prioritize? Um, we convinced the local planners that at this point, this being part of a strategy to implement new pedestrian routes, it was very important that they prioritize pedestrians, got a good zebra crossing, pull sidewalks through to make it uh, nice and convenient for everyone, young and old, to walk in this area. And they did this and they implemented it. And this was done not six months ago. But actually I thought the sidewalk had gone through here as well ah, at one point. It had been changed. Uh... They changed it back? Yeah. Yesterday we learned that the traffic police uh, and the traffic planning department had then gone in and removed the implementation again and to create a new road space. But it's really bad that they that it's changed back. Just still care uh, care about uh, uh, vehicles. It's very uh, important that we actually create examples showing that you can make a different choice, that it can be attractive to make a choice where you don't have the car, and that is still um, rare in a Chinese context. The small scale of the street is extremely important. My wife and I started in Italy to document very carefully by counting the people and seeing whether they were standing in the sun or in the shade and what was going on in Italy and why was Italy famous for being such a nice place for people. We 
We always did the old cities in five kilometer an hour scale. That means that when you move at five kilometer an hour walking, you can see the people you're sort of squeezed a little bit together. And it's a very sensual and interesting world. You can see all the details. There are colors, there are smells, there are acoustics, which are very interesting. If you go to a modern housing area, it suddenly makes sense that much of the stuff in the suburbs are made so that the cars would be happy when going 60 kilometers an hour. For doing 60 kilometers, you need big spaces, big signals, big turning radius. That's a completely different scale from the scale of the walking man. I think everybody would love to live with a garden and a house. And I think that's a natural instinct. But when it's the choice of how much that costs you and how much time you have to spend getting to work, you might start to weigh that up. So people will work out the economics of the city. They'll work out that, it, that living in the suburbs is maybe not a good investment. And what used to be our parents' idea of an investment will not be ours. I would have agreed with you three or four years ago that the great Australian dream of a, a freestanding detached house with a front garden, a large back garden with two cars in the garage was the universal aspiration of young people. I have seen a shift in that view. Just this week we've had academics saying that creating these suburbs by just rolling out houses like a carpet is actually going to create ghettos of the future, which will make people ill, which will have poorer health outcomes. So we're building in a problem for ourselves. Not only obesity, but social isolation and financial hardship. All of those symptoms are now showing up on the edge of Australian capital cities. Can you change the city model if it was built for the car? What I found in the 1980s uh, was that Melbourne was in fact dying. Almost no population living in the city. And we were asked to write a strategy for change. And all we did was listen to the people. We just listened to what they were saying and realised that what the question uh, that we were being given was, how do you make a 24-hour city but make it feel and look like Melbourne? Isn't life something organic? that jumps up wherever we don't expect. Can you design and plan a lively city? Can you change people's desires? Why walk when you can choose the car? Why live in a small apartment when you can have a house and a garden? Rob Adams discovered a hidden resource in the layout of the downtown grid, which became key to attract life back to the city. The laneways were the crabbiest space you could think of in Melbourne earlier. It was the, the, the it felt unsafe, it was the backside of buildings, the, you had all the um, air conditioners and dumpsters and everything was in those spaces. And it was never ever thought about as a, as a people space. But at the same time, they had this very nice human scale to them. They were narrow, they were in shadow, which is nice uh, in, in most part of the year. So by opening up the buildings and transforming the friendliness, you could say, of the environment, it completely changed the, the life of the city. And, and the streets now became places where people wanted to stay. So we started introducing cafe bars. And we went from two in 1985 to over 500 today. So people now sit on the streets, enjoy coffee, and the streets have become our living room.
Melbourne has been consistent over the past 30 years in its policy to bring people back to live in the city centre. In the future, the population is expected to double, but the city planned to accommodate for this growth without needing to build more suburbs. We have 3.6 billion people living in cities today, 50% of the world's population. That's going to ri rise to 6.5 billion people by 2050. We're almost going to have to double the urban capacity of our cities in 40 years. Are we as nimble as China? Well, China is undergoing what is the world's greatest social experiment. How do you move more than a billion people from an agrarian to an urban environment? And that urban environment is, is not for all. And, and I see things they do very quickly, but I also see things where I worry about what is the consequence of that in 20 or 30 years' time. So there is nothing to fear from growth. There is from unplanned growth. And if we start to address how we make people happy, how we make our cities financially viable. The only way is to look at cities very carefully and understand how they work. We haven't got the time or money to build the infrastructure we'll need for the capacity we need in the next 50 years. So we'll have to look at our city and start to think about how do you do more with less? If we look back 50 years from now, the city was um, almost a city like Venice. Unfortunately, after the Liberation War, the government's uh, policy became very, very central towards Dhaka, and internal migration started very, very high rate. Nowadays, it's almost crossing 7 to 8 percent every year. And Dhaka started growing. So having that huge pressure, if you could just control and conserve our potential resources, this could be a wonderful city. Dhaka is the fastest growing city in the world. Half a million people move here from the countryside every year. To handle this pressure, Dhaka follows the urban model we have seen in China and the West. A model based on cars, highways, high-rise residential suburbs, and a massive consumption of energy. Why we have to copy a Western world and just push it into a planning process? This particular notion of living, how we are addressing it, how we are denying it, how we are denying their aspiration, is a sample how we are destroying the very flavor what this city could have. A group of activists in Dhaka have translated Jan Gehl's books. They have introduced his methods of counting pedestrians, rickshaws, and public life to inspire a different approach to planning. I think it was the year 2005 when the common people saw that the, the government is taking the initiative that they are the banning rickshaws from some road. So what is the reason they are, they are pointing out the rickshaw is one of the main source of traffic congestion in Dhaka in Mirpur Road? Okay, then the ban the rickshaw. And now what we found, now this traffic congestion is still there and they just overlooked the main issue. The main problem was there, the parking problem. The cars without any parking chair, they, they had the facility. Uh, these private car companies, they are just uh, making the cars, and now this is the zone to sell it. So it is one of the policy they are giving loan, maybe the ADB, maybe the World Bank. 
they are giving loan for making the roads for making the flyovers so they are making it it is their business area they are selling it they are giving us aid not it is not aid we have to pay back them and we are burdened with that loan so we shouldn't follow that model So when the government is banning rickshaw, they are destroying the opportunities of employment and 300,000 rickshaws with 600,000 rickshaw pullers, they are the poor people. So by this, what they can do? If they earn something for today, they will eat. If they don't, they don't. Only the 5% are using the private car, 37% are using the um, rickshaw. If the 37% are shifted for using the private car, so I think I can move anywhere. I have to just sit in the car and what, I don't know. I have to sleep there, I have to eat there and everything. It's my car and I have the car and I have to do nothing. <laughs> That's it. policies and the planning when it comes from the top. It never understand the very aspiration of the people. So when we're doing it, you have encompassed only the rich people or upper middle income people. Rest of the people who actually dominated in terms of number has been left out. And the whole problem started growing. Because unfortunately, if you don't encompass everybody into your planning and understanding of transportation, housing, you actually walking towards a chaos created by yourself because you have disregarded them, but they are always there. You can say they don't, they don't exist, but they do exist, and the problem started from there. How this modality should be uh, prioritized? Who should be prioritized? The new 10-year plan for improving Dhaka prioritizes highways and road infrastructure. It is heavily funded by the World Bank. The government will spend $10 million on pedestrian facilities, while the budget for flyovers will be $1 billion. Activists complain that the plan is socially unfair. सम्भव अतः जो ये जाए एक भालू एक माध्यम जाता है तेर पाशा पाशी दूर घटो ना शे निरुच्छाई तो करार जो नॉन तो मैक्टे कारण है शबे काज कोट से Thank you.
At the current growth rate, the population is expected to double from 160 million people today to more than 300 in just a few decades. With this car-centric development, if each person have the one car like America, we will have 300 million cars. Will there be any space in Bangladesh? So <laughs> I am, sometimes I become mad. I, not mad, but I feel very uneasy. We are sinking. <laughs> I don't know how I can explain you. You see, sometimes I cannot sleep night, at night properly. When I think that what we are eating, if all the foodstuffs are very, uh, you see, with the toxic chemical and etc. But other problems is becoming are more and more pro prominent. Dhaka is considered a high-risk earthquake zone. The urban development magnifies this problem heavily. The landmass is fast being covered with asphalt and concrete, which causes rainwater to flow into the polluted river system. The groundwater is therefore the only resource, and it is depleting quickly. Last year, a small earthquake at magnitude 5.4 hit the city. In the case of a major earthquake, it is estimated that 80,000 high-rise buildings will collapse. There is a connectivity. Soil structure is changing. As a result, uh, even a minor earthquake can become the more, create the more problem. You see, the when a structure, the soil condition is changed, then bearing capacity will less. Sometimes I cannot uh, sleep because I see that if if uh, uh, earthquake with six magnitude, most of the building will not survive. We have certain conditions of learning. A kid walking through the road and around your house, what he sees? He sees small trees getting out of the seeds, growing this insects, small butterflies. If you see life, if you see how it grows, then when you grow up, you will take care of lives of others. It's not school, it's not a book. It is the time frame of your life you learn. So when we make us turn a city into a place where you don't walk, your kids don't walk, you are raising generations. When they grow up, they will be not human. I think we can see what is the, what is end of this bridge because our destination is the western modern world. Now we have started the journey. Now we are in the middle of the bridge. We can see, oh my god, this capitalistic model, all these modern things, all these cars, all these highways destroyed their life. Now I can set up my journey, okay? Which way I can go? We count, we measure, calculate, and maximize. But did we count the four billion people living in third world countries? And what will happen when they drive a car 
pollute and consume the amount of energy that we do. What if we started all over? Imagine waking up and being attacked by someone with a large piece of wood. I mean, you didn't know what was happening. The power was out, the noise was incredible. You could not stand, you could not find anything. You had uh, no sense of um, bearings. The, the room was strewn with books and things that had fallen over. And this was happening for maybe half a million people. In 2011, Christchurch, New Zealand underwent a devastating earthquake. The inner city suffered the worst damage, and most casualties there happened in high-rise buildings. Yes, the immediate re response, you know, after the earthquake is build it back as it was before, just make it the same, you know, just rebuild it. And again, there's a, there's a lot of research about cities after disasters, um, and, and, um, and what happens after a disaster is your quality of life is destroyed. I mean, it's, it's really, it's much less than it was before the quake. And you kind of have a choice, really, that you can try and just get back up to where you are. But the international evidence suggests that what you want to do is try and improve the quality of life beyond where you were before, to try and make up some of that lost kind of ground. You know, we've got five years of, of, of kind of hardship and, 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 the, and the eye, but, but, but if we can make Christchurch a better place, maybe that'll help us kind of regain some of that, um, some of the, you know, the, the lost quality of life, the lost, um, you know, the damage to our physical environment. The centre of Christchurch is named the Red Zone and the public is not allowed to access the area. The structural damage to the building still standing is so great that the entire city has to be demolished. It is estimated that up to 1,500 buildings will be torn down before rebuilding begins. I remember the first time I came to Christchurch, the city was in shock, and I guess they needed a kind of therapy to talk about everything they'd been through. But how do you start? How do you start rebuilding a city from scratch, almost, or a central city? And I guess the big thing was you had to be inclusive. It had to be everybody's project. First of all, uh, let's uh, give this presentation. Please welcome back to Christchurch, David Sim. Um, I've heard a lot of remarks this morning about these foreign experts that are coming and telling you what to do. I can promise you I'm not going to tell you anything that you have to do. My job, I'm here to listen. I want to find out what you want to do and I want to try everything I can do with my team to help you do that. So what kind of city do you want? And everybody has something to share. And so the idea of a program that would reach out to everybody in the city in which we could get their ideas together and help us understand what it was that our people wanted going forward. Because the adversity of the destruction was the opportunity of rebuilding a new future. We called it share an idea. Obviously we need new buildings, but it's about the spaces between the buildings. So um, I think we've got a huge opportunity to, to get the spaces between the buildings different and better than what we did before. Spaces. So I think it's really we, we thought of it like a movement, if you like, um, where we invited people to, sh to share an idea about what they, how they thought Christchurch should be. And we ended up with 106,000 ideas you know, about what Christchurch should be like.
we employed maybe 100 people to sit down and type in all of this information. It came in online, it came in on bits of paper, or post-its, and out popped all of the key words that people were focusing on. They wanted a low-rise city, much like many of the older European cities. They wanted spaces that they could relate to. They wanted cycleways. They wanted more gardens. They uh, wanted a, a smaller retail area, not one that was spread out. They uh, wanted effectively a city for people. The people of the city, without being told what to think, came together and their ideas were really identical to so much of the work that Jan had been doing around the world. It's really proving, in a sense, that the things that we want when we are people, as opposed to when we think as corporations, are actually very, very common. We made a section in the plan we showed that you could actually have quite tall office buildings, six, seven storeys, and still have the tower of the cathedral standing proud above all of that. And then if you imagine the cathedral, the tallest spire in the middle of all of this, you know, it could be a fantastic composition. But if you imagine what this was like before, like the normal sounds of a city, you know, cars, buses, people talking, children laughing and screaming, it's kind of, it is really weird, the silence. And the fact you could hear birds singing. And that seemed like, you know, it shouldn't be like that. That should. And it's just, you know, wow. Where do we go from here? And I think if you're a historian, you can talk about this English style or this Victorian style. I think for ordinary people, the buildings have a much more important value, which is about memory. Like, that was the cafe where I used to go on Saturdays with my granny. That's the shop where I bought those shoes. That's where my hairdresser was. This is, this is where I met my girlfriend. I was standing on the corner there, and I saw her for the first time there and just two doors down, we had our first cup of coffee. Those kind of stories are much more interesting because they, they touch us emotionally. What's great about cities is they're full of these stories, overlapping stories, overlapping memories. I mean, this is actually, um, I mean, it's, it's very moving when you read some of these, like, why are we doing nothing to save what's left of our heritage building? What of our past will we leave for our future? I think people are feeling all of their memories are going to be gone as well. And I think that's a really interesting way of seeing the city. It's not just bricks and mortar. And I guess that's kind of coming through in all of this. Because, I mean, this is about, this is about love. I mean, it's, it's heart. And it's about people, I mean, they're all, they're all heart-shaped. Because people love their city. And I guess, they want back or they want at least some of it back. The plan for Christchurch has become a big battle. Landowners and developers fight the regulations against high-rise office buildings. The public insists on a low-rise city with a lively public center where residents and businesses can coexist. The large majority of people want low-rise buildings. When we did the, the economic feasibility study, which takes time, you know, interestingly, in fact, you know, six stories, when you look at the return on the, you know, so the, the building costs versus, you know, the likely kind of rental, the best return was about six stories. So above six stories, you've got to have greater foundation depth, you've got to have stronger structures within the building. So you kind of, there's a kind of threshold above that where actually the costs, you know, go up much more than the return. So you have to build a lot higher than that to kind of, you know, to balance, you know, to get as good a rate of return. The big problem with tall buildings is interesting because there's loads of research on this. You can ask a surgeon or you can ask a district nurse, what is the foundation of health? 
and we'll see more or less the same thing. Fresh air, exercise, meet people. And the higher you, up you, you are in a building, the less likely you are to go in and out spontaneously. So it means the people in the buildings have more boring lives and you have much less life on the streets. So this thing about getting out, moving about, meeting people is really, really vital. And so I wanted to find a, a tool, a way of communicating what cities are about, but I wanted to find a simple way of talking about it. And what I discovered was, if you give, you know, put a few pieces of Lego in front of people, people immediately start playing with them. I guess I'm a, I was a Lego kid. I, I played a lot with Lego as a child. And you can discuss uh, how dangerous Lego is, is in terms of like kind of like you're kind of like the god in the world of Lego and you build things from above in this kind of helicopter perspective that can be very dangerous for the city because you start building things because you can without thinking what is it you really need. Welcome to the Lego workshop. We're doing three different tasks. The first one is to build yourself, then think about the kind of things you like doing in the city and then build a model of the place you'd like to see in the central city. Okay. Cool. And away, through these small, small scenarios, you can start building up pictures of what the city could be like. And I can think of something which would be really cool, because if you imagine we were just inside the buildings, we could be looking down at all this activity, and that would make us want to come outside and be part of it. This could be a starting point for talking about all these very complex city issues that we're trying to approach. Because if you start thinking about who's the environment for, who are we working for, it's, it's, it's for people. On April 18th, 2012, the responsibility for rebuilding Christchurch was taken away from the city council and placed in a new unit led by the national government. The government promised to respect the overall vision for the city. The greatest strength that you have when I'm faced, for example, with central government or from a business community, some of whom who may say, no, 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 we don't want these rules. I've got the ideas and the vision of my people here. Are you going to ignore that? The city council developed a legal framework called the second volume. This described restrictions on high-rise buildings and rules against parking. This volume was discarded by the government. We've decided to accept volume one, uh, but in the meantime, put volume two aside for a period because it will be premature, I think, to accept those rules uh, and, and it would be most appropriate to review those rules as the blueprint is developed over the next 100 days. The dilemma is difficult. The enormous rebuild will provide a massive boost to the economy if it attracts fast investments from developers, international hotels and corporations. But profit is short term. So is political decision making with elections every four years. But cities are built to stand a hundred or a thousand years. It seems like you are at a tipping point right now between becoming LA or becoming Copenhagen. Very much so. Yeah, yeah, yes, and um, and while you know I'd like to, you know, pretend that I'm in control of that, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, there are much there are big economic you know forces at, at play really, which will shape the future of the city and the behaviour of people. So there's a lot of talk about the future city of Christchurch and it's very exciting and yes, it will be green and cycle friendly, la la la. And I, I find that very exciting, but my, my kind of question is, well, what's going to happen now? Because are people just going to wait for this future city to be built? I think mean, I think people need things to do now. People need to feel like something is happening. Gap Filler provides a way for um, something to happen now. 
you get life in a city by not trying to plan for everything, by allowing things to happen organically where possible. Life comes when you give people a chance to contribute something. And I think that it proves that people need spaces to come and, come and do that kind of thing, to just come and dance. I guess there is this very difficult tradition of, which comes from the way we teach architecture and planning, the idea that one person can solve everything. And we even have this term, the master plan. Like, I'm gonna do the master plan, which will answer all questions. And of course we know it's impossible. Cities are unbelievably complex. So even the idea of a master plan is really crazy. All we can do make is a kind of a framework we can make a very robust framework which allows life to take place. One thing I can be sure about in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years, 100 years, human beings will be more or less the same size. Our senses will work more or less the same way. Um, we'll probably enjoy meeting each other um, in the same way we enjoy meeting each other today. I mean, just as happy about handshakes and hugs and flirting glimpses. I don't believe we can plan for things. I don't think by me drawing a line, I can make things happen. I can't force anybody to do anything or be anyone, but we can make invitations. We can invite people to walk. We can invite people to sit to stay, invitations to a better every day, uh, a better way to cross the street, a better way to wait for the bus, um, a better way to, to live your life. And that's all we can do. 200 years ago, the world had one billion people. Today, we are seven billion. By the end of this century, we will be 10. We estimate that 80% of us will live in cities by then. How will life in a city look 100 years from now? As I see the scenery, city planning has been going on for quite a number of years with a rather incomplete toolbox. It is so cheap to be sweet to people in city planning. Compared to any other investments, it costs next to nothing. So there are really perspectives because man is basically a very clever animal who knows what, what he likes and who knows when he is uncomfortable.